This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show today, coming to you from the historic Women's Club of Hollywood, celebrating the iHollywood Film Fest after party and rock concert for the premiere of the Paul Gervasi film, The Original Charvel Gang. Kevin O'Neill, us boys who played Charvel. Charvel, they were so nice to us. When we came, we were a budding group and we were very unique on the rock scene. And we didn't have a lot of instruments that were going to work for us. When Grover Jackson and they, and they saw what we were doing, they went out of their way. And they made sure that Victor Johnson, our guitarist, and myself on bass, that we had top-notch instruments and that we had top-notch designs and that we were on the cutting edge. So we were in those movies and when we were on Saturday Night Live and when we were in these new recordings and this, we were, I was playing all Charvel instruments and they made sure that we got first class treatment. So everyone there is first class and I want to put it on the record, they treated Victor and myself completely first class, second to none, so, so thanks guys. And we did a couple of movies. We did 48 Hours. We uh, got a Grammy nomination for Ghostbusters. You know, we did the second single for Ghostbusters. And then since then I've been writing things for Devil in the Blue Dress. We were, uh, my brother and I were in that one. And I got a new one that's out, Troubled Waters, and just all kind of stuff going on. The one that I kept, I coveted them all. They all kind of went away. And I had a beautiful yellow one that I used in 48 hours. It was stolen from my mother's house while my mother was inside. They didn't touch my mother. She was fine. So I kind of kissed it to God and said it was someone is going to enjoy it and let it go. But I, I, I'm just glad the movie's keeping it together. And we got to figure out some ways to, you know, keep it. The, the people who make these things keep us timeless. And we have to figure out ways to keep them timeless also. Tell them about your band a little bit. Yes, I, I, I'm the lead singer of a rock and roll band called The Bites. We put out our first record in 2019. We have another one coming out this summer. Very, very, very in your face, uh, in your crotch rock and roll. And um, no, nobody's doing what we're doing. How much like Rat does this sound? Or Motley Crue? I was going to say, there's definitely some Motley Crue reference. I love Rat. I sing, you know, I, I don't necessarily sound like Vince Neil, I don't sound like Axl Rose. I don't sound like Piercy. I, I, no, exactly. I, I sound like myself, and and that really carries what the bites are and what we sound like, and uh, it's it's just fun. We got a tune coming out in July, uh, July 16th. You're a singer. Yes, I'm a singer. I've been in a few bands, you know. Not to mention, I uh, I'm friends with Slash and Guns N' Roses and those boys, and we were actually auditioning me for the new Velvet Revolver. It never happened because Slash went with Miles Kennedy and the rest is history. But I've been in several other bands and whatnot, but now I just date hot chicks, ride my motorcycle, and jump on stage with some of my friends every now and then and do kind of like a guest spot. How, I, how are you making a living? Well, actually, I own a hair salon and I run a, a club called Los Globos in Silver Lake. So I'm gonna do like a, a Rock Mondays or something like that, bring, bring the bites in. Bring some other bands. You know the Ultimate Jam Night? I helped start that. That was at Lucky Strike with all the bands and they were all they were the rock and rollers and they were coming together. It was awesome. So I'm, I'm gonna bring it to my club. And uh, I don't know, maybe Jordan and his band can be the house band or something and we're gonna make some things happen. But uh, rock and roll is always gonna be in my blood. Look, I'm sorry about, dude, I'm, I'm the one that got Miles Kennedy in, Sl in Slash's band. Did you really? Yes. Oh, thanks a lot, pal. No, do, you know why? Because look, listen, listen. Oh. Matt Sorum, it was, it, I think it was right before his solo album came out. And I told Matt Sorum, I go, how come you guys don't get Miles Kennedy to be in Velvet Revolver? And he goes, Matt Sorum was like, hey. That's idea. not a great, that's a great idea. He, and then he picked up his cell phone and started, I'm going to call so-and-so about a lot. I'm Blair, sorry, right. man. I, I'm sorry, I'm blaring out. You're bro. blaring out. Blaring you, out, man. You, you blared out too much information, and the Velvet Revolver never came back. You know what, it was so damn good that you almost can't oh, repeat gosh. that. You know, that's why Scott went back to STP. You know, because you can't put another singer in Stone Temple Pilots. You can't yeah, forget about it. You know what I'm saying? Bands like that are too iconic. You know, I was friends with with Scott. You know, uh, I'm friends with Miles. Uh, I actually sung a song by Miles Kennedy at my mom's funeral. I'm not trying to get emotional or nothing, but uh, you know, Miles is a is a good pal. So my life is is rock and roll hair. 
I cut hair for all the rock stars. That's basically my jam. All the guys in Guns N' Roses, Gilby Clark, you name it. That's basically what I do now. When music stopped, I didn't stop. I kept working by, you know, supporting myself doing their hair. Uh, Warren D. Martini from Rat, good friend of mine, was doing his hair. You do one guy's hair, you do them all in rock and roll. The only guy who won't let me touch his hair, can you fucking believe this? Lay it on me. Ready? Sebastian Bach. Really? Wow. I, I do his kid's hair, I do his wife's hair. He you won't let me. Him? No! I don't know why. He said he had a bad experience in Ohio one time. They turned his hair orange before he was uh, on Broadway doing the Jekyll and Hyde yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, he'll never let anyone else touch his hair. He'll just let it go and fuck it. Whatever. So I'm like, Sebastian, you're nuts. I'm opening up an 80s hair salon called Salon 1984 because that was the best year in rock and roll. It was. Think about all the albums that came out in 1984. I don't know what the album, 1984, right? Yeah. Van Halen, Jump, Thriller came out. Thriller was... Uh, Born in the USA came out. No shit. Uh, Purple Rain came out yeah. in 1984. Striper, the yellow and black attack. Hell oh, yeah, Oh, man. Oh, man. So it's going to be Salon we 1984 love some during the day, and at night, yes. it's going to be Studio 84, and it's going to be Perfect. an 80s fucking nightclub. It's going to be sick. It. The reason why I'm here tonight is I played a young Grover Jackson in this movie. So nice. Paul, the director, and I are friends. So he came to me and asked me, hey man, can you play a young Grover Jackson in this movie? I said, absolutely. So the classic car, the hair blowing in the wind out the window, the guy going to Tower Records to sell my idea about the Chevelle guitars, the Jackson guitars. That was me. I'm in the fucking movie. Rock and roll forever. A Tommy Bowen from the band Warlock with Doro Pesh. Okay, Tommy, tell me about how Charvel guitars changed your life. Charvel, holy shit, this is about Charvel. Uh, well, shit, one of the first guitars I ever owned, which I recorded the Warlock record, was actually uh, an old uh, gray Charvel, which then also a Jackson I had. But Charvel, I mean, I, that, was the, that was the guitar to get when you didn't have any friggin' money, so you save up everything to get it. And I got a, an old one without tremolo, which is gunmetal gray with double humbuck with a, a, a brass bridge and all that, and it just played like hell. And then tell me about what's going on with you and Doro right now. Well, the cool thing is we got the album. The album I played on was Triumph and Agony with the song All We Are and all that. The live record comes out in September 24th on DVD, Blu-ray. It's just recorded live at Sweden Rock. Because I came back to play with Doro and the band, so it's just friggin' awesome. And that drops the 24th of September. David Jellison. Yes. Are you jealous? Never. I heard that you helped to build one of the first Eddie Van Halen guitars. Actually, I helped. Uh, I designed the Michael Anthony bass, the Jack Daniels bass. This is I designed, I worked with Grover from um, 1980 to 1983, off and on, and, and I started touring with Van Halen in '82, and I did some design work with those guys. So in 1984, we were talking. I sold Michael. I was playing bass and rat. It's kind of a giant story. So I was playing bass and rat, working at Charvel. I got hired by Van Halen. Michael Anthony bought my splatter bass off me. I had this, uh, the, the, I call it the Charlie Manson bass. So I sold that to Mike for $325. And um, then I sold him my Fuck You bass, which is on the Motley Crue album cover, the first album cover. Sold him that. And then we were talking one day, and I just, you know, after I'd known him for a couple years before the 84 tour, and he's like, I'd like a special guitar. And he's a huge fan of Jack Daniels. I said, why don't we just make you a Jack Daniels bass? And he's like, we can do that? I go, yeah, let me add it. So I worked out the design, uh, took it over to Grover, and Grover was like, yeah, we'll, we'll make this happen for you. And his tech, guitar tech, uh, Kevin was involved, but ultimately it became his sort of signature bass, and now it's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So that was that was sort of that. But I you know, worked with Van Halen, the US Festival, did the... 82 tour, 84 tour, then um, South America, and then we then I went off with Dave and worked with him on his film that never got released, but we prepped for it. Did his la his tour 87, the Eat Him and Smile tour, and then left and joined the film business. How did you mentally, spiritually, and physically survive touring with Van Halen for five years and then working with David Lee Roth? That's a good question. I got into it because I love music. I'm not a drug guy, I'm not a drinky guy. There's nothing more exciting than the sound of the 15,000 people cheering as the curtain drops. You just can't top that. And it, 
that was it. And I worked my way very quickly through the organization because playing in Rad and, and bands before that, I did all the design work. I designed drum risers and guitars and amp lines. So by the time I got to Van Halen, I was ready to go. And I, there were a lot of people who were not reliable, quite frankly. And once I got in that organization, everything they asked me to do, I did to, and I kicked ass at it. And, then, and I very quickly, I climbed up the ladder and just became part of the show, part of their, you know, part of their show and, and kind of a go-to person. And it was wonderful. I would say, I, best experience of my life. And I'm glad I did it when I did it. And I'm glad I got out when I got out. And you look back on that time in rock and roll, and it was just, it was magical. It really was. It was like, anybody was on the strip between, you know, 1981 and 1986, there's nothing like it. And there never will be. And I just, I feel blessed. What is important about the film, the original Charvel Gang? Well, it, what, what set them apart was craftsmanship. Grover Jackson ran the shop, and immediately he wanted to reach out to the professional players, the badasses in Hollywood, the badasses in London, badasses in New York. He wanted to, he pursued the pros. And by creating a product that was better than everybody else, and also by creating a, a custom product, they flocked to him. And everything was handmade, handcrafted. We had a lot of guys who, you know, who were on the, strong on the design side, so they would, they would come in, you sit down with the artist and go, okay, let's talk about what you want and how you want it. And it was, people flocked because there was nobody doing that at that time. BC Rich was to a degree, but it's just, Charvel was doing a lot of out of the box thinking. I got to do a lot of design work there. I designed a gun guitar, dragster guitar, Tommy gun. It was on the cover of uh, Guitar Player Magazine. And you just had latitude. I would come to Grover with an idea and he'd go, do it. And that was great. He was very encouraging on that level. So it really made it an exciting place to work. There wasn't a lot of money to be made, but there was a lot of creativity. And that's really the, the part that makes the, the difference when you're, when you're making $2.25 an hour, if then on the side you get to make guitars and feel you have uh, a little bit of um, innovation in the process, then it makes it worthwhile. What is important about the film, the original Charvel Gang? I mean, it, it's just a lot important about the film, you know, just like about life situations and stuff like that. A lot of people go through certain things and this kind of film is just letting you know how it is, you know, out there. So it's really important for everybody. So I feel like everybody should just watch it. Wicked, what are you up to right now? Man, I'm working on a lot of new music right now, man. I got my Wicked Hot Sauce. I got my Wicked Lashes. I'm working on a lot of new music, you know, which our favorite rock stars and pop stars. So I'm just being focus and coming out with some new music. Are you producing? I produce at the same time, but I'm just being more focused on vocals. What are you most proud of? Man, I'm just most proud of basically everything, you know, because every time I perform, it's just a lot of people out there showing love. I see all the positive stuff, you know, things out there, and it's just pretty much everything, all of the above. The Blaring Out Show.